Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyor La Shoboale. We begin in Equatorial Guinea, where the death toll after a series of explosions on Sunday has sharply risen to 98. The blast hit a military base in the country's main city, Bata. Officials blame badly stored dynamite, along with uh, stubble burning by nearby farmers. As rescuers tried to search the wreckage for bodies, three young children were found alive and taken to hospital. Medics and rescue workers in Equatorial Guinea searched through rubble on Monday as the death toll from a series of explosions at the weekend mounted. The health ministry says the blast at a military barracks in Bata has now killed 98 people. Around 600 people have previously been reported as injured, and President Teodoro Obiang Nguema says almost all the city's homes and buildings have been damaged. It has a population of over 250,000 people. He's attributed the accident to negligence related to the handling of dynamite. Images published by local media showed bodies wrapped in sheets lining the side of the road and children being pulled from under piles of broken concrete and twisted metal. The explosions come as the former Spanish colony suffers a double economic shock caused by the global health crisis and a drop in the price of crude oil, which accounts for around three quarters of state revenues. The foreign minister Simeon Oyono has asked for international help following a series of large explosions at a military base March 7 that killed 15 people. The situation in the city of Bata, where there were a couple of blasts, has led to the loss of several human lives and substantial material damage. The preliminary information we have is that there are 500 injured and 15 deaths. The blast happened near a military base in Bata. The most important thing for us in this meeting is to ask for help for Equatorial Guinea from friendly nations and international partners. In this unfortunate situation, you are aware that we are facing a health emergency. And now, on top of that, this new tragedy in the city of Bata. This is why we thought it was appropriate to inform you this way, so you can sincerely help Equatorial Guinea. The majority of Equatorial Guinea's 1.4 million people live in poverty and the government has called for international support for the search and rescue effort and to rebuild. On Monday, Spain's foreign minister said a shipment of humanitarian aid would be immediately dispatched. At least two men were injured on Monday after attackers raided and burned shops owned by foreign nationals in the city of Durban, South Africa. The attacks have been linked to young members of the Umkonto Wiziwe Military Veterans Association, the former ANC's armed wing. On the streets of the central business districts, traders could be seen scampering to safety after shutting their businesses for fear of attacks. A few days back, a Nigerian-owned telecoms accessories shop was attacked and looted. Also, a Senegalese was allegedly stabbed in the violence that erupted on a separate day. These scenes have played out severally since November last year. The South African Human Rights Commission was due to meet those involved in the violence today as it expressed concern that it could trigger more widespread attacks. Joining us now is our South Africa Bureau Chief, Betty Dibia, for more on this. Hello, Betty. Hello, Tenny. What more can you tell us about Monday's attack in Durban? Well, it's a scene that has played out several times where you have um, unknown persons throwing Molotov cocktails or, or petrol bombs into shops. Sometimes when the most of the time when the people would have closed uh, early hours of the day, late in the night, and they get these shops uh, burning. In some cases, they just destroy them and loot in some cases. And the, the painting the scenario, the people you have there are mostly foreign nationals. I mean, a mixed meal of Africans, uh, Burundians, uh, Zambians. Lesotho, Mozambique, name it, Nigerians as well. So it's played out several times. The, the first major ones um, happen, major one happened when the group claiming to be a part of the MKMVA, that's in Konto Wisizwe, a grouping which 
the main body has not exactly identified with because I don't I can't really say what's going on between between them. They they, they went they wanted a march which wasn't exactly permitted. The the police contained that march and and sent them you know packing, but they still found their way to go early hours of the day, throw petrol bombs into people's shops and then loot the ones they can. Uh, and they're saying they want the foreign nationals to leave the country. It's unfortunate. Like a woman, when I went there, the woman I was speaking with from uh, Burundi said, look, we left um, suffering in our own country to just eke out a living here. And one of the incidents, she lost her son for a few minutes. You know the agony of losing your child even for a minute. Um, found her child at the other place because they had to run for their lives. So what happened on Monday is just a repeat. You know, the police, we, we keep talking to the police spokesperson, Jay Nika, in Durban. And, and his, he says investigations are ongoing. But some of the people claim, look, the police may be handicapped. It's difficult because these are allegedly locals who are hmm. doing this. And... Some that have been arrested at some point are usually released, um, they claim, and they're saying sometimes the police um, doesn't exactly support them, even when they try to calm things down, if they try to defend themselves. That's their claim. I can't verify that. So so they're, they're feeling left, you know, not supported, not protected most of the time. Um, but then when things happen, the, the authority, the ambulances come, the police comes around uh, to, to help to calm things down because they wouldn't want it going beyond that uh, CBD, uh, the Central Business District. Yeah, Betsy, it's tragic, really. Like you said, this isn't the first time these attacks in Durban have happened. But why does it seem there is no headway in stopping these attacks? Um, it, it, it won't be easy for me to explain to you the politics of this. These are people who are locals, who are claiming or insisting that the foreign nationals who are there, the people you find there are people selling uh, hair extensions, people who make hair, people who sell clothes, you know, retail clothes. Um, and, and they're saying these people, they don't want these people here because they're taking over, that's the expression, taking over the place, taking over jobs, whereas these are people who are self-employed. So it's ironic, and, and I remember the last major incident in February, uh, Nigeria's consul general went over there to meet with the, the head of the police in that province. They held a meeting and they complained. He he was quite um, open, you know, he, he, he voiced his concerns about uh, Nigerian citizens being, of course, it's not only Nigerians who are affected, but he was concerned about uh, the, the repeated attacks. And the police um, uh, commissioner in the province promise to ensure that things uh, um, are not allowed to happen again. And he also talked about some early warning committee. We keep hearing that, but nothing happens because we keep seeing these things over and over again. And it's unfortunate, which is why the Human Rights Com South African Human Rights Commission sent out that statement saying uh, they condemn this. Condemnation is not enough. We expect, uh, or people expect the authorities to actually say something. I recall the march to the, the mayor's office. The, I know our consul general was not able to meet the mayor. But when the major march by the so-called MKMVA um, grouping wanted to happen in November, the, the mayor, uh, that's uh, Thomas Kaunda, didn't give them audience because uh, uh, we understand that he didn't support what they were doing and deploy the police to just quell the march, which they knew would, would you know, end in violence. So people expect much more uh, walking the talk of the authorities to ensure that people just, you know, people at the lower end of the economic ladder, you know, don't keep suffering. Uh, and then they're hearing investigations are ongoing investigations. I mean, I can recite the statement without even speaking to the police. Investigations are ongoing. Some people have been arrested. This time around, I don't think anyone has been arrested because uh, the, the uh, Brigadier Jay Nika said, they are known persons. We don't know yet, but uh, the police has managed to, to calm uh, the situation. We don't know what will happen tomorrow because it happens every other day. Yeah, a really, really sad situation there, Betty. We do hope, you know, there's a speedy resolution to this situation. Thank you so much, Betty, for bringing us up to speed. Thank you very much.
And still in South Africa, a search is underway for more than 100 crocodiles that escaped from a breeding farm in South Africa's eastern town of Hazyview in the Mupamalanga province. The reptiles are believed to be in the rivers and dams around White River and the surrounding areas. At least 50 others have been recaptured after their enclosure collapsed following heavy rains. However, residents of Hazyview have told SABC they are living in fear and would like authorities to assist in removing the crocodiles. The city's tourism and parks agency has warned residents not to go near dams and rivers or swim in the waters. People in the Mozambican province of Cabo Delgado are complaining that the security forces are not doing enough to protect them from Islamist attacks. About 10 communities have been affected in the past two weeks, with some villages attacked several times. They said Mozambique's military refused to help them because they had not been authorized by their commanders to go into the field. The army chief of staff said the population of the port city, Mosimboa da Praia, which was taken over by the militants last year, would soon be able to return. Hundreds of people have been killed and tens of thousands displaced during the past three years of Islamist violence in northern Mozambique. Senegalese opposition leader Usman Sonko has called for more protests against President Macky Sall after being released on a rape charge. Mr Sonko's arrest last week sparked days of deadly protests. The arrest of Senegal's most prominent opposition leader last week prompted violent confrontations between protesters and police. But it's not the only factor driving the civil unrest in one of West Africa's most stable democracies. Firstly, the arrest of Umane Sonko after he was accused of rape has been treated with skepticism by some. This is because this is not the first time President Macky Sall's opponents have found themselves up against criminal charges. One example is the former mayor of Dakar, Khalifa Sall, who is not related to the president. He was given a five-year jail term for embezzlement in 2018, but he was pardoned by the president after the election, raising suspicions that the charges were politically timed. Macky Sall's opponent also fear he may be seeking to extend his presidency beyond his allotted two terms, as emphasized by Sonko after he was released on bail on Monday. We demand Macky Sall declare publicly and without ambiguity, this yes, no, yes, no business is over. A president that neither says yes nor no, where does that lead us? Where is my goodwill? We are not in a monarchy that I know of, but he should declare publicly and without ambiguity. And the people demand it that in 2024, he will pack his bags and he will leave, one way or another. President Saul has so far not ruled out using a constitutional change in 2016 to run for a third term. Sonko says his arrest was politically motivated, but the government denies this. But it has also been a lightning rod for other frustrations in the country. Many Senegalese resent what they see as corruption, injustice and economic imbalance caused by rapid modernization in the nation. However, the president says he understands the anger being expressed by the citizens over economic difficulties that are being exacerbated by the global health crisis. A court in Tunisia has sentenced the brother-in-law of the ousted president, Zain Albedin Ben Ali, to 10 years in jail for corruption. The court found that Ben Hassan Chabelsi and the owner of El Hawa TV had set up a private company where the side phoned off advertising revenues from state television. Both men were fined $15 million. President Ben Ali fled abroad after months of protest 10 years ago.
to our coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic now, the first batch of 96,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine has arrived in Sierra Leone under the COVAX initiative. The doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine come, come weeks after the arrival of 200,000 doses of the Chinese vaccine. A new poll shows only 43% of people in Sierra Leone's capital are willing to take a COVID-19 jab. Even less people are willing to receive the Chinese one. The country has confirmed 3,920 cases of coronavirus and 79 deaths. Now, in the growing field of African social media influencers, Senegal-based food blogger Carol Vignon has carved out a juicy piece for herself. Her dishes have garnered thousands of followers and given her a unique perspective as an African woman in the world of influencer advertising. Take a look. Franco Beninese food blogger Carell spent the better part of a decade building up her first 10,000 followers on Instagram. Only three years after hitting that milestone, more than 10 times that number follow her life on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, with international brands chomping at a bit for a slice of her pie. Today, this is all we do. When we are proud of something, we put it on social media. Uh, like the business of social media influencing is relatively also, new territory in sub-Saharan Africa, with personalities of all kinds looking to carve out a niche of their own. Karela has built an audience not only in Francophone Africa, but within African diasporan communities living across the Western world. She says her African-inspired recipes either trigger nostalgic or PK interest. I know that my followers really love African food uh, because it's colorful, it's tasteful. Um, I, I prepare like all kinds of food, but I know that my, fellow, my, my followers, when I put, when I post uh, mafe or chebujian or African recipes, they really, really react. They like, they comment, they, they share. Um, I know that that kind of content uh, they, they really like that. Carella's consistent and creative posts on social media have secured her partnerships with food companies, airlines, furniture manufacturers and more, all of whom are keen to tap into a community that looks to Carella for advice on how to cook, look and live. We create a lot of contents, <laughs> uh, food contents with brands uh, with, uh, like, like um, President, uh, I'm an ambassador for them uh, since 2017. I create uh, recipes with the milk, butter and cream. So this is the food part. Um, we are lifestyle influencer because uh, we talk about um, traveling with uh, Air France or Air Côte d'Ivoire. Um, we create uh, baby content because uh, <laughs> I'm a new mom. <laughs> So uh, I work with brands, with brands, sorry, to, to create uh, content for the mom and dad community following me on Instagram. The biggest challenge Carella faces as an African influencer is getting local brands to take her seriously. Most local companies, she says, struggle to understand how an internet personality could have more influence than a TV commercial or a billboard along the highway. But for Karela, social media management is a relentless job that never ends. She's thankful to have been able to leave traditional work behind in favor of her social media career. And finally on the program, organizers of the Sudanese European Film Festival 2021 have set up an outdoor drive through cinema for visitors to watch documentaries, feature and short films in the lineup. The Sudanese film fans can watch from their cars during the festival. Take a look. Sudan saw its first drive-in cinema, bringing family and friends together for this year's Sudanese European Film Festival in a new outdoor ambience. Around 100 vehicles gathered in a wide parking space, resting side by side before two large screens showing Sudanese and Arabic subtitled European films. 
فكره الناس تحضر بعربياتها وكمان فكره انه هم I can hear to attend the European Film Week which is made up of mostly Sudanese films and there are European films. This time is very different. That's why I wanted to attend. We're watching films from our cars and that's something that has never happened before in Sudan. People bought food and drinks sat inside next to and above cars as the films screened in the evenings. A maximum of four people per car was allowed and mask wearing was mandatory outside the vehicles. Because of COVID, we're limited and we cannot do um, audiences as we used to do, side by side. There's an element of COVID precautions. So we ask people to come in their cars and behind this you see people in cars just about to start, two huge screens, about 100 cars uh, over seven nights watching these Sudanese and European films. Tickets are given freely, but registration is required to ensure the availability of a parking space. The once European film festival in Sudan began including Sudanese films in 2018, according to the British Council country director. When we got to the end of 2018, we thought that maybe we could do uh, something more innovative and make this a Sudanese, not just a European, but a Sudanese European festival. Bring in some capacity building from Europe for Sudanese um, producers, script writers, um, but also to put on Sudanese films, not just European films. And that's what's going on behind it. The festival was prepared and implemented by the British Council. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenio Lash Shubo Ali.